welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello, welcome to All Things Policy. Today we are discussing about uh, how to prevent next pandemic. And to discuss that, we have with us today Dr. Harshik Kukreja, who is my colleague at Takshashila Institution. I'm Megha Padhi, I'm research analyst at the Takshashila Institution. Before we start, I'd like to tell our listeners about uh, Takshashila's public policy program. As you may know, Takshashila Institution is an independent, non partisan think tank and a school of public policy. We have education programs lasting one semester and one year that are tailored specifically for people like our listeners who are interested in policy. They're all online and you can take them from anywhere. Admissions for our 12-week graduate certificate program in public policy are now open. And we also have defense and foreign affairs and technology and policy programs. Application deadline for the September 2022 cohort is 27th August. You can visit link given in description to find out more about this program. So coming back to discussing how to prevent pandemics. First of all, welcome Harshad. Hi Mega, how are you? I'm good. So tell us more about what you have learned by reading Bill Gates' new book on how to prevent pandemic. So Bill Gates is a tech billionaire turned philanthropist who is trying to cure better global health, party and a host of other issues and has been successful to a certain extent. For instance, in polio, polio was funded at large by his organization. The Global Polio Eradication Initiative was funded. Uh, he pay, His organization played a huge role in funding that. And they have been very successful. Only two countries, Pakistan and Afghanistan, still report wild polio cases. So Bill Gates' take on pandemics, what he's written, what he says on talks, what his blog posts say, what he's like trying to, his ideas that he's trying to like spread everywhere and convincing people to join him stem from his experience and from what he says that he has talked to experts, from what COVID taught him. So it's a very interesting take and it lays down a clear roadmap on what we can do as a global community and as a country to prevent COVID part two situation in which another infection comes in and like devastates the whole country. I believe Bill Gates has been actively campaigning prevention and about pandemics for a while now, right? Even I, I remember somewhere reading that even before COVID-19 happened, uh, I think Bill Gates had done a talk and it, I think it went viral when he talked about pandemics and how pre- how accurate it was. Like some people also claimed that this pandemic is Bill Gates' creation. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite There were a eerie. lot of conspiracy theorists which said mm-hmm. that this is Bill Gates this doing this. Really but so yeah, I think that was somewhere in 2015, he did a TED talk. Mm-hmm. And he says that 90% of the views mm-hmm. on his TED talk are after the COVID pandemic. Mm-hmm. So he had earlier warned, he had said that how ill prepared we are for a pandemic and how ill prepared we are for a new infection, which has the potential to wreck havoc. And well, pandemics are usually like once a century thing. So nobody was that interested and that invested in pandemics. Mm-hmm. There was sort of a black swan event and nobody thought that it will happen and we would not have the treatment, we will not have the diagnostics, we will not have. And especially the global north, especially the rich countries, Europe, uh, Northern America, they are sort of the people who set the global health agenda Mm -hmm. because they fund that and they, they basically staff a lot of these organizations. And infections from these countries have like come down a lot. You will not find malaria, dengue, tuberculosis to the level we find in India, in uh, France. Mm -hmm. So that was not on the agenda and they were not basically prepared for a pandemic and nobody in the global health community was focusing on the pandemic, pandemic, uh, sort of like preventing a pandemic. Mm -hmm. So what does Bill Gates say about creating a pandemic prevention measure or what does he say about how to prevent that? So he terms the team 
Germ. It's a global epidemic response and mobilization team. Mm-hmm. So he pitches this idea that a team of dedicated people run by WHO because he says WHO is the only health organization which can get give credibility to such a team mm-hmm. which will have members based across all nations. They will also form the part of the nation's team, the nation's sort of like early response and detection team for infections and outbreaks. And they'll also report to the germ headquarters, the WHO team. Uh, he says that this team should be made of experts in genetics, supply chain, computer modelers, epidemics, even people like able to handle diplomacy, able to negotiate. So he says unless he pegs the number at uh, 3000, he says that 3000 employees would be needed mm-hmm. to run a team successfully. He says that unless a full-time team is created, we will not be able to prevent the next pandemic. But he does not specify that how will that team interact with the government. Will that be part of the government? Will it be something like the BCCI in which, for instance, BCCI is sort of de facto India's representative to ICCI. Mm. But it is not part of the government Mm. machinery, machinery as such. So he has not specified there could be like certain ways either the team is run through some organization which runs parallelly to the government and depends on government's cooperation. It exists outside the government. The second thing could be the team runs under the WHO ambit and then works with the government. The third thing could be the team is part, very much part of the government, the national government, but closely cooperates with the central team sitting at WHO Geneva. But this is for WHO to figure out, right? How it would be the best mechanism country to WHO has not been the best person to deal with pandemics. So it is for us to figure out and then push them into the right direction. So uh, are we getting any better in detecting outbreaks or do we still have some work to do on that front? So he says that we should get better. Mm-hmm. And he, what he says that using, he uh, narrates a story in which he says that a, any pandemic movie you see, So you will have a person sitting, there are cases detected, a helicopter will fly, two people will disembark in full PP, sort of like a spaceman. They'll have all the protective measures. They'll know where to do, go. The village or the town or the block would be quarantined. And somebody sitting at a computer somewhere in a huge lab will run a model which will say, oh, so Europe only has 36 hours before the infection spreads everywhere. So he says, Obviously, this is a very science fiction idea and there's no such entity that exists. That is why he uh, tries to push the idea of germ. And there's no, we do not have that technical knowledge that we can like pick an infection and put that in models and get a very good, very accurate and a very predictable model at the instant. But, and there's no, and the most importantly, there's no uh, cooperation between departments in, in a nation, between states between global agencies, between people, civil society and the government. So that is also important. And when we talk about detecting pandemics, so some literature suggests, for instance, you take monkeypox. Uh, WHO also has this viewpoint which says that monkeypox was already present in certain countries, but because of better detection, because of better RT-PCRs, and we now have a lot of RT-PCRs, we were able to detect it more because it's a self-limiting illness. And... Uh, it would have remained undetected because we are at a heightened sort of like, uh, we are like trying to, we are very cautious uh, looking for infections Mm -hmm. and RT-PCR is now easily available at places and uh, that is why maybe monkeypox is like, we we are able to detect monkeypox better. But what he says that RT-PCR, the traditional RT-PCR is very expensive. He pushes for new innovations which are able to, which you are able to detect sort of like a plethora of infections from that same test and at a fraction of that cost so that we they are able to use that in quantity and get quality results in a short period of time. So key point here is that just because we were prepared because of COVID-19 pandemic, it was easier to detect monkeypox. Yes. And we should have similar preparedness for other a range of other infections and have yes, a single yes. test. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, but this is, okay, I mean, this is fine, but... Uh, there should be something we can do, right? We as a citizen or we as a normal population who does not have access to this all scientific thingies. What can we do? So at a personal level, 
unless you are advocating for better policies there's nothing much you can do you can get yourself vaccinated for all the diseases there are you should follow public health measures you should mask up you should maintain social distancing and have some faith in the scientific community and the government because science is an evolving sort of science is always evolving and as we get more information the recommendations obviously change and so the best thing for you could be to push for more research to push for more science friendly policies and to push for the government to be pandemic ready but do our individual habits matter like for example in our indian indian society i think also in asian societies in general we have this custom that we don't enter our home with the shoes on you always have or at least used to have a bucket of water in front of our home so that when we will enter our home we used to always wash our hands and feet before entering do you think practices like this and i'm not talking about the cultural aspect here i'm not trying to mm. you know encourage cultural stereotypes here but do do you, do you think that this individual habits matter when it comes to yeah. pandemic protection yeah so obviously uh, hand washing is a very important habit which leave alone covid we leave alone monkeypox all water borne diseases cholera uh, diarrhea diseases it will prevent you and it's a very good habit to have mm-hmm. and so for instance you look at old indian houses or houses in general around the world they used to be very ventilated with large windows and everything but now we have even offices even hospitals we have windows which are sealed there's no way ventilation can go through and fro so you can have offices you can change your architect so that cross ventilation is possible so that respiratory infections are not able to the infection rate for respiratory infections basically goes down because of cross ventilation and because you are allowing outdoor air to come inside and indoor air where there could be suspected pathogens there could be people who are infected so you are not staying in that focus point of where somebody is coughing and uh, you are inhaling that droplet so is this why the centralized ac buildings are more at more risk of so central infections. centralized ac buildings if they have filters mm. like good quality filters so they are not at as much as risk but nothing beats natural ventilation and the who recommends for each for the type of for instance it divides buildings into categories residential non residential and hospitals so it recommends certain ventilation rate per person so if you meet that minimum ventilation rate even in a centralized closed building then it's all right but it's usually difficult and you will have to have stand alone air purifiers which were which are like pretty popular up in north when they are like the pollution level goes up at least with the hepa filters that's interesting okay so on this note let's take a break and uh, we'll continue this discussion afterwards Welcome back to All Things Policy. Today, Harshad and I are discussing how to prevent next pandemic, and especially what Bill Gates has to say about how to prevent next pandemic. So, um, we talked about you know creation of team, how to you know, detect outbreaks, and how can we protect ourselves. What about treatments? Do you think how can you find treatments which are faster? And what does Bill Gates has to say about this? so th- unless you invest in basic biological research you won't be able to get faster treatments because if you look at if you want treatments for disorders which you have never seen before you have to have approaches that work for those disorders and you'll have to go through a trial and test method so th- unless you invest in basics uh, for instance you look at uh, shifting a little from treatments you look at uh, mrna vaccines pfizer and moderna So mRNA was a concept which has been pushed from 15 20 years and it was being used trying to be used in vaccinations and everywhere but if mRNA concept would have not existed we would have to use the older inefficient ways of vaccines and trying to combat the infections so unless you have technology such as this which you can like pick up at that time so for this a lot of the narrative is that private companies don't want to interest uh, invest in basic biological research so the government has to do it government has to put money in universities government has to give out grants even to the so called unpopular orthodox ideas or slower ideas which will maybe give you return in 10 years 20 years but you have to invest in them so that you are able to get 
toolkits to fight and even if covid would not have happened mrna has a lot of applications which would have which will revolutionize immunization vaccines and everything so invest in basic research and only then you will have sort of like good treatments uh, in covid i think everybody was a little disappointed by how how late we got new treatments and how sort of not that efficient the early ones were okay so i have one small doubt to uh, government intervention is not always you know celebrated in a sense it is expected that since there is a demand for such a, you know vaccines or treatments uh, they should have there should be a private intervention basically and to an extent we saw this for covid also private companies were more successful in bringing out this you know, treatments of course i can see it with your point that just because the research already existed now they could do this but don't private entities play a bigger role when it comes to pharmaceuticals in general yeah private companies do play a very huge role and they are very efficient in bringing out products and the speed with which they move is like very quick as compared to government but for instance if you look at covid shield which was developed by astrazeneca and oxford in uk so a lot of money for the initial research was by the government okay even for mrna moderna got the basic grant from the government so for basic research the uh, private entities do not want to invest because basic research you cannot monetize basic research in a 5 10 year period mm-hmm. basic research may lead to certain applications further down the line and there that is a big may or maybe just add to the literature that's okay. it so private entities don't want to push into basic research so as a, as a public health good government should treat it yeah for in basic sciences government should invest a lot and because the private entities won't and unless you put in money so how will research function you you even if you, you don't have to pay salaries people do other work people volunteer that is sort of a fictional thing thing nobody would want to volunteer you would still need a lot of money for infrastructure you will still need a lot of money for the reagents you want you will still need a lot of money for whatever biologicals you are using so you need money and a lot of it and if nobody wants to like pay for it even a highly motivated individual cannot do fundamental biological research without it interesting so since you're talking about you know, treatments and vaccines do you think that we should have specialized vaccine no by specialized vaccines do you mean vaccines for certain disease yeah. i mean i since i think i heard somewhere that bill gates is i think he has also talked about that we should have a broad spectrum vaccines for our thoughts on it so that would be a very huge thing and if we get for instance covid-19 was is a part of the coronavirus family but it is one particular virus so if we will have vaccine for all which works against all coronaviruses so we would have cured common cold we would have cured sars we would have cured covid-19 so that would be much more efficient and that would work much better for that also we need basic research so that you know on what coronaviruses you can target what is the common point and all coronavirus way you can target so it would be a huge b- breakthrough which would be able which would help us eradicate a lot of diseases and if somebody is like trying to make them that is the best place to put your money so because the results would be phenomenal so if you cure common cold then how will i get to holiday how will I- <laughs> I mean, what will I tell my boss? Kya, why am I taking leave today? <laughs> Headache. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So oh, yeah, but that does make sense. I mean, less vaccines would also make it easier from implementation point of view, right? To, to get a large population vaccinated would be probably easier if you're just one vaccine to do that. and longer vaccines and we also need vaccines which last long last longer okay. don't need boosters to every 6 months or so so okay so this seems like a huge task so do you think that you know, research or in general addressing this problem the way we approach the health issue in rich and poor countries is different or how how should we address this issue yes covid-19 only sort of like emphasized the health inequality between rich and poor countries in poor countries sort of like developing countries like india you had shortages of oxygen 
you would not have faced these situations anywhere in Europe. Uh, in poor countries, you had people dying because of shortages of bed. There was a paucity of beds, etc. in certain places, in certain countries. But that was, uh, for instance, in India, if you, even if you required in- intensive care and you got a normal ward bed, that would be, it's all right, huh? you got a bed. But the shortage that we're talking about in richer countries is specialized beds, which specialized team. So when they say shortages of doctor, they mean you don't have a pulmonologist. In India, it means you don't have a doctor. So that is a huge difference. The buying capacity of, I think US had ordered 10 times its population size vaccines pre-ordered. So for every one citizen, they had ordered 10 vaccines. So the rich gobbled up all the resources and because they were able to and they already had a better baseline to go with. They already had detection systems. Their hospitals were better. Their healthcare infrastructure was better. Their rifle system was better. So they have a, they had a much better, better sort of like a response. And there is and always have been a difference between rich and poor countries. So what does the book say about this? So the book says that one of the most important issues in tackling the next pandemic would be resolving this difference. Which unless there is a lot of GDP growth and that growth is distributed equitably among the population that would not be the gap would not be filled I think in at least three to four or five decades. So economic development is very important to address this gap between rich and poor countries and how they handle health issues. Yeah unless you have money how do you you know to sum it up money solves everything. Yeah. Okay so how do you summarize key arguments in book? Or even the key arguments of Bill Gates' position on how to prevent next pandemic. So, if I have to summarize, I'll say make a team which is able to detect pandemics, early outbreaks and prevent them from being pandemics. So, he quotes an uh, epidemiologist. The epidemiologist is Larry Brilliant. He quotes him in his book. He says, outbreaks are inevitable, but pandemics are optional. So, if you are able to detect outbreak, outbreaks early, and you have the capacity to deal with them, you can prevent them from becoming pandemics. And because of increased globalization, man-human interaction, climate change, urbanization, a lot of diseases, the chance of a disease jumping from an animal to a man has increased. Zoonotic transmission, the chance of zoonotic transmission has increased. So the capacity to detect and contain infection is the number one ask. The second thing would be better vaccines and better therapeutics. Third thing would be, huh, one more thing he talks about is, which I, I think failed to mention, he talks about running drills. He says that we spend so much money on running military drills and uh, sort of campaigns and war games. He says the number of lives you like sort of save by running a military bill at a cost of maybe 110 billion or something. And if you put that 10 billion into a pandemic sort of a war game, a COVID-19 war game, the number of lives and the number of resources, economic cost you'll save, even the uh, benefit to national security would be huge. So that is a good place to put your resources in. He says, practice, practice, practice. So unless you practice, you won't be able to identify how different departments coordinate with each other. How do you interact with the public? So unless you run sort of like games, games, the fourth point would be better baseline healthcare for all. So unless you have that, you won't get a better response the next time. Even if you detect a new virus somewhere in South Sudan and you don't have the infrastructure to contain it, that is of basically no use. The only response would be countries would ban flights from South Sudan to their place. Mm -hmm. And that would be obviously too late because they would have already landed. The people would have already infected like a lot of countries. Yeah, these are very interesting suggestions, actually, and I hope you know policy makers around the world are uh, around the world are listening, especially WHO people, because in last few years WHO's role in you know preventing or even managing pandemic has been questioned very seriously. Before we leave, one more thing, one more thought that I had reading about his work, Ford Foundation, or other philanthropist, as you may. So the type of sway, the disproportionate sway, billionaires have on health global health is sort of like unprecedented so the your funding depends on the generosity of the rich so if suddenly Bill Gates decide so I don't want to eliminate AIDS I'll work on dementia 
so aid program half of the world aid program would collapse because he funds and he also brings a lot of funds with him so he had the collision i think it's for malaria tb and aids so you tend to wonder at how much of your health depends on the whims of the rich he's doing good work i don't disagree with that but you tend to wonder if that is a lot of power for one person to hold but yeah i hope it, i mean i this is good that it's put for good use and i hope it stays there yeah thank you so much for joining us today arshit and uh, thanks to our listeners for tuning in to all things policy thank you mega thank you everyone if you liked our show don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the ivm network you can tune into them on the ivm podcast app ivmpodcast.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts you can also follow ivm on social media the handle is at ivm podcasts on twitter facebook and instagram and hey if you'd like to dive into takshashila's research on technology strategy and economic affairs check us out at our twitter handle at takshashila inst or our website takshashila.org.in